to our second round table in this series, The Future of Engineering. A big thank you to our donors who have made this session possible. We have a great group of thought leaders here today that are gonna share their insights and expertise with us on the future of buildings where we live and work. Now, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce two of my colleagues at the ACEC Research Institute. Joe Bates, who will serve as our moderator for today's session, and Kevin McMahon, who will be monitoring the chat box and fielding your questions during the session. Joe, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Daphne, and thank you all for joining us today. First, I'd like to introduce you all to each of our panelists. We have Dino DeFeo, who is managing partner at AKF. Dino is a respected and admired leader whose market knowledge and passionate commitment to clients have formed the foundation of a 25 year career. He understands the importance of working as an integral part of a design collective with the express goal of realizing the direct client's vision. We also have with us Peter DiMaggio, co-CEO of Thornton Tomasetti. Peter is responsible for defining, articulating, and driving the firm's strategic vision. In addition to leading the development and execution of the overall business plan, he directs key strategic initiatives, such as identifying new markets and merger and acquisition opportunities, as well as instituting mentorship and professional development programs. I'd also like to welcome Arathy Gouda, who is Associate Director of Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. Arathy is a team leader for the company's Chicago's Performance Design Group, charged with researching new technologies and recommending integrated environmental design solutions that are substantiated with computer simulation for SOM projects, uh, project teams worldwide. And finally, I'd like to welcome Kate Whittles, who is a partner at HR&A Advisors. Kate specializes on the future of work and how to best shape places, train people, and deliver infrastructure to make today's cities ready for tomorrow's opportunities. She creates strategic plans, public-private partnerships, policies, and programs to guide governments, developers, and businesses on growing tech and innovation ecosystems in cities around the world. Thank you all very much for joining us today. I'm gonna to jump right into our questions. It's obviously no surprise that we're living through this pandemic and it's completely changed the way that we live and work. Uh, I think we have all within the blink of an eye had to create new ways of working and communicating and, and some of the participants and viewers who were with us during the pregame show might have heard us talking about some of those challenges we live with. So my first question I'd like Pete to start out with. Pete, are we gonna see a fundamental shift in where we work in the future? Um, I do, I think we're going to see a fundamental shift. Uh, what I think is less clear is what that shift actually looks like. Um, let, let me give you my example uh, on this. Um, right before COVID, we have about 1500 people and the large majority of them were working in the office. COVID hits, we send as many people as we can, almost close to 1500 to work remotely. And early on, it really looked like as we were learning from this, that we were going to have this situation where more and more people wanna work remotely. That was an early indicator. What we're seeing now actually is a lot of people wanna be back in the office, whether it's for that social interaction, their ability to be more effective. And I think in the last two or three weeks, and this is how uncertain this future is, what we're getting from our employees is they want flexibility which is a really interesting challenge. They don't wanna be full-time at home and they don't wanna be full-time in the office. And if I had to make a guess, I would think that that is going to be a, a, um, something that stays with us, where people want that ability to do some time at home and some time in the office. And it's a really big challenge, right? It's a challenge to get people really effective in the office. It's also a challenge to get them really effective at home but just think of what this means from an IT point of view, right? How many different computer systems do you have? Do you have monitors? Do you need the right working environment both at home and in the office? Um, the second challenge that comes from that is, again, early on, it's really interesting to see how things progressed over the last month. Um, early on, I think the immediate reaction was, we're probably going to need less real estate for our entire office structure because clearly people wanna be at home. Now, all of a sudden we're saying, but if they wanna be partially at home and partially in the office, 
do you still need less real estate or do you just need different real estate? So the simple answer to your question is yes, I think you'll see a fundamental shift. A much more complex question to ask is what do we think this is going to look like? And if you really wanna challenge the group, I think it's gonna look very different in suburban areas than it may look in urban areas due to the challenge of public transportation. So are people able to do both of these and still use public transportation to get to their office? So. Kate, uh, Pete mentioned yeah. public transit. Uh, what do you think is gonna happen with public transit? And you're in New York City, so how's that gonna affect people that are working and living in New York City? Yeah, um, I mean, it's a big, it's a big unknown about transit, but I think as, as Pete was starting to talk about, the mood changes so quickly. If you ask people a month ago, six weeks ago, would you get on the subway? No. But you, um, you asked people last week or yesterday, and you're starting to hear stories of people, I went, I'm taking the subway, it's clean, it's the cleanest it's ever been. Um, and so I think to, to, to what Pete was saying is that there's going to be this um, half in, half out experience, and we're going to figure out how we best travel to the places. And it's really about what's the role of, of the physical office in how we work. And that's really what we need to figure out. Um, and that will change how offices are laid out. But it used to be that we had to produce everything in the office. And now we're realizing that some things that we um, can produce, it's more effective to produce it, the knowledge economy stuff in, in our home and maybe having recurring meetings in our homes. But the culture, brand, desire for uh, you know, interaction, and I think as an amenity to employees for retention and attraction, the office will play a role in that sense. Um, and so I think it's, it's really thinking through what the role of the office is going to play for businesses and then what does that mean for, for neighborhoods and then what does that mean for the need for transit? Because maybe the, the demand will be actually less if we're only half of us are going in half of the time. It feels almost like we've let the genie out of the bottle here with having people working from home that in the past, there was a lot of pushback from many companies that were saying, hey, we don't want you working from home. And now everyone was forced to do it and somehow they're making it work. So I don't know, Arathy, do you, what do you think about that? You know, have we just let the genie out of the bottle and not going to be able to put it back in? I, I think so in a lot of ways. And I don't think it's necessarily about trust, even though maybe sometimes that was a, an issue. I think it was about collaboration. And so engineering, architecture, planning, we're very collaborative disciplines. And so there was always this idea that you had to have the group think in the office. And I think obviously now, as Kate was mentioning, some of the things are a little less efficient remotely, but people are seeing that actually we can be very collaborative um, in our home environment. And uh, I think this is actually very positive because we've been talking about that for a long time. There's uh, an emissions reduction. There's a positive personal benefit. There's a lot of good things that are happening um, or silver linings as a result of this, um, but we almost needed to have the push. And I think that does speak a little bit to what Peter was saying about there's a little bit of a multiplicity of futures, but let's face it, we're a complex society and we'll, we'll keep going the way we were going if it's working. And this has forced us to maybe shift faster and I think in a good way. Um, as we're all seeing, there, there's some benefits that I don't think we're going to go back uh, to the way we were. Dino, any thoughts on this? Well, I think everybody has, uh, you know, some good points. You know, you start thinking about what is the role of the office in, in our environments. And, you know, it has a huge impact on the culture of your firm, your interactions in the office, how you work with one another, your collaboration. But nowadays, with the tools you have online and the collaboration that you can do online, it will change the way we work. And you will start seeing some more decentralized offices. And headquarters might not be the size they used to be anymore, but you still might need the office space for more of a, um, a collaboration area or a, a conference center with a few seats and you'll see more hoteling. All the things that we've been talking about for years, this has really accelerated that. And, and I think it's going to continue to accelerate. And things are going to be like this until there's a vaccine. I mean, a lot of people won't be comfortable coming back into the office until that's the case. So 
until then, you know, we're still going to be experimenting with the conditions that we're in and seeing how things work and what doesn't work. So, Dino, I have one thought on that, uh, sort of a follow-up question for you. Maybe dive a little bit more deeply into this issue of, uh, there's this near term, of course, but, uh, and then let's, let's assume we're, we're going to have a vaccine and, and everybody is able to return to some you know, level of normalcy, but what's the long-term implication on how buildings, commercial buildings, will look in the future? Um, this pandemic will, I think, be fresh in everyone's memory for a generation at least to come. And so what kind of design considerations will we need to make in terms of health and safety, you know, cleaning the offices, elevators, things of that nature? Well, I mean, you know, we're an MEP firm, so, you know, I could stick to some of the things that we've been dealing with in, with our clients uh, on the MEP side you're starting to look at buildings that are going to be much more robust than the engineering infrastructure. Um, we spent a lot of time looking at the energy efficiency of buildings, and we're going to start spending more time looking at the well-being of the occupants of the building. And there's going to be a push and pull there. Uh, there's still the energy codes we're going to have to comply with, but a lot of things that we'll have to do to make few people feel comfortable with coming back post-pandemic. And let's keep in mind, this is not the only pandemic we've been through. Well, this is the worst by far, but we've had SARS and a number of others. And every couple of years, it seems like there's something else that we're talking about. So the infrastructures of these buildings will have to be much more robust, much more flexible, you know, greater ventilation rates, greater air changes, higher humidity, because we're finding that humidification is great for the well-being of the person, regardless of during pandemic or not. So all of these things impact the energy efficiency of a building. So we will try and we will need to figure out how do we balance the well-being of the people within the building and yet still comply with the energy efficiency mandates that are being required of us. So that's kind of where we're gonna we're gonna have to to be. Whether it's UV lights that we're adding into systems, greater filtration, uh, decentralized systems. You know, there's gonna be a number of challenges on the, in the engineering world in order to make people feel more comfortable with how buildings are performing and how they're protecting the people within the building. Arthi, what about the elevators? We were talking about that before we went live here. Are we gonna have, you know, elevators that are 10 times the size as they are now? Or are we, how are we gonna move thousands of people up and down, you know, these high rise buildings? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, there might be some things, even to Dino's point, there, there are things in the market that are already stacking elevators and others that increase capacity. But I think, you know, we haven't been able to always sell those on projects. So I think what's going to happen is these things that were harder sells before are going to become better or easier sells now. So this nexus of energy and wellness, particularly to elevators, you know, I think it's, it's touchless, it's call button censoring, it's stacked elevators. Um, I think there's also maybe a reality of a public health response. So by nature, these are more confined spaces and um, will we be more like Asia, you know, look to our Asian friends and say, they're very used to masks. It's not a, an issue for them to wear that or wear gloves um, because some of those things can't be solved strictly with social distancing. But I do think it's a very important time and even in the environmental movement, it's always been planet first and not people. And there's been a real, problem with messaging with that that mentality because of course we know the eight ball is energy efficiency carbon reduction but until we connect that to stories that people can relate to then it's very hard to change hearts and minds and i think this this piece of wellness it's very relatable people can understand um, so i think there are going to be some very important conversations in the engineering community um, about how we can do these things. We've been, we've been talking about humidity for years and, and advanced filtration. Um, and we're building on that with um, code policy and rating systems. But these are not always things that our clients opt into. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to um, be asked to do those things more consistently, have the cost of it drop, so that it can become more ubiquitous in the market, which is essentially what we want. I think, um... What's interesting about this right now is um, this is an opportunity for building owners to become really creative and force them to really differentiate, them, differentiate themselves and try the new systems that they, we've been talking about and pushing for them. Because now 
buildings aren't just competing with other commercial buildings in their own submarket. They're competing with other submarkets. They're competing with residential products. They're competing with re retail products. People are working out of restaurants now. And so I think this is a real interesting opportunity for what the building will actually offer in the long run to make companies want to continue to pay rent and to make employees want to come back in. I mean, you can offer up that you're going to have better air in your office in, in, than you are in your home, for example, or sound quality or other things. Um, that's, that's where the, the building owners have this opportunity to really keep, keep their asset as it is. I think that's such an important point. I, you know, as Kate was talking, it, it struck a nerve. Um, if you think back to September 11th to 9-11, um, when, when that event occurred, um, the first response was, we're never gonna build high rise buildings again. Yep. Right? People aren't gonna, and so, of course, that's not what happened, right? So it took a while, yeah. and then people started talking about how do we address this issue? And then people got creative, and then people started to figure out how to build security in. And one of the questions, I just saw it on the chat, was what happens to existing buildings that aren't ready? Um, you know, this was a, a really good example. People upgraded those buildings, they invested in them, and then they used that to try to draw tenants back in. And the big mm -hmm. difference I see now is, we're only a few months into this and already you have some of the smartest people on the planet talking about how do we solve this issue and get back to work. And to me, that's one of the biggest differences. It took us a long time after 9-11 to say, we're going to go back into a high rise building. How do we address this? Now we're saying, and, and again, look, the first month of COVID, people were saying the office is dead. Nobody's ever going to go back. We're, and I, the, the speed at which the design community has started to attack this problem, to me, is, is a really positive thing. And so I think, you know, to the point of how much is it going to cost and what are people going to do if groups like everybody on the phone, right, even people listening in, are already starting to try to solve this, uh, I'm really excited to see where this ends up because we're, we're not stuck on the problem. We're already talking about the solutions. Yeah, so this we, is going to be a, a balance. I mean, th there's going to be so many different solutions that are going to come out of this, to your point. I mean, there are a number of different ways to tackle this. And whether it's, uh, you know, office space that's spread out a little bit more, you're going to have social distancing within the office. You're going to need that office space to in order to, to keep people. I mean, we used to talk about densification. We did a tremendous amount of studies about how many people we can put on a floor. You're not going to have that anymore. That's not really going to want to be what people want to do. So office space is going to be a necessity for a long time. It's not going away. So it's a matter of, I guess the question came in, what do you do with the older building stock? We're going to have to figure out how to convert those buildings so people feel comfortable again, just like after 9-11, just like after Sandy. You know, things are going to be different, but things will be, you know, we'll still need those office, that office space. I want to come back to that issue and question in just a few minutes. Uh, but first, Kevin, do we have any questions from the audience on the topic of the buildings that we live in, or sorry, the buildings that we're working in. Yeah, we do, Joe. We have a couple of, of really good ones. Uh, first one um, is about what we've been discussing. And the question is, how much of the effectiveness working remotely is due to the fact that we know our colleagues when we got put into this situation? There are, uh, the situation? The audience members asking, what strategies would the panel recommend for bringing new team members into the group collaborative culture um, effectively while there are we're working remotely. My, I could start with that because we actually hired people pre-pandemic and they started uh, post-pandemic. So it was a matter of introducing them to the people who they were going to be working with via something similar, via Zoom or via Teams. And it's a, a daily and sometimes multiple times a day collaboration with them. And it's a challenge to make sure that the culture of the firm, you're imparting that on the new people. Um, and we're going through something now where we're bringing EITs and interns in. So we're also working with our interns and it's again, multiple touches a day and making sure that they're, they're getting the education that, that, you know, we promise them and that they need as they go back to school. And also for the EITs that we're starting the culture and then starting to introduce the culture of our firm to them from the beginning. So you have to work with them daily. You have to make sure they have someone who is their partner that they can reach out to with any questions, but you have to make sure that there's a connection back to the firm consistently. Yeah, I think the, go ahead, Kate. 
Sorry. I think, you know, we've talked about mentorship and collaboration and kind of those types of things are just going to have to happen even more so. And I think that's great, right? We, not every firm really prioritize mentorship and now it's going to happen and it's going to ha happen across offices. And I think you'll actually get to know more people than you would have just the people that were within your team or on your, on your floor now. Um, and so that's an exciting opportunity to have. And I think that that point that Kate just made is even more powerful if you're a very diverse spread out organization. So we have 50 offices. And so it's clearly more difficult for us when we onboard somebody now in that local office for all the challenges that come. But one of the things we've been really successful with is building a culture between offices, right? We've gotten very good at this kind of a call and getting to know people. In the old days, what would happen is you'd be in your local office and everything would be on a voice, a, a conference call. And I don't know how everybody else feels, but I like this environment so much more than the non-facial conference call. And we, I think we build culture and get to know each other. So this Zoom call has been a, a clearly a challenge, but I think going forward, it's something we're going to use. We're talking about you know, trying to keep the carbon footprint down, having a lot more meetings in this environment and being able to bring more people into those meetings rather than flying them from 50 places. So I think there's an opportunity to really take advantage of it. Kevin, do we have any other questions on the buildings that we work in before we move on to the buildings where we live? Yeah, this is an interesting question, uh, Joe, and it's about the cost of, of the existing buildings in many cities that require retrofitting and a lot of these uh, retrofits may become too expensive and cost prohibitive. What will happen to these buildings? Arthi, do you have any thoughts on that one to start us out with? I think we were, we were talking about it or touching on it a little bit before, mm -hmm. but I think um, obviously there's a lot of fun costs and uh, we know the real estate market is, I mean, this is a, they're one of the biggest financial engines and hard to move, slow to move and change. But that makes, I think, all of us believe that, no, we are not going to abandon these, which is a good thing from, you know, a carbon sink perspective. Um, and I think the technology is all there. And, and many people touched on that already in the panel. But there are a multitude of um, retrofits that are already starting to happen. I think um, at SOM, we have a getting back to work plan, I'm sure. Kate, you know, and Peter have similar, where it's, you know, we're looking at different things. How do we space out? How do we have shifts? How do we have advanced filtration? How do we have flush out? How do we have twice daily cleaning? And, um, you know, again, those aren't cost prohibitive measures uh, for people to undertake. It's not talking about a whole AAQ upgrade or, or change. It's about how much extra outside air can we bring into the space? So, um, and when we can't in a certain space, um, how do we socially distance more, um, you know, and think about those other, other issues. So I think people are being very flexible, which is quite interesting as we get back into the space. Um, and again, thinking not build new, but how do we, how do we work with what we have, which is, is really important. Yeah, the solutions are not a one size fits all. You're going to have, you know, air handler retrofits and upgrades that are going to be relatively inexpensive and some that are going to be very expensive to do. But, you know, let's be honest, the building stock is very expensive. Leases are very expensive. And if in order to track people and charge the leases that you're charging, you're going to have to ensure that the, the occupants of the building are safe. So it's going to be probably something that's going to be demanded of landlords in order to make their building stock of value. So I, I think there's going to be ways to afford it. And as technology gets more affordable, it's going to be easier and easier to do. I, I also think there's going to be a lot of adaptive reuse. I mean, we're going to see, we were seeing a mix of uses that before this, people wanting to live closer to where they were, people wanting to have more options. And so for some buildings, that can be adapted release because, and they can't be easily upgraded, they're gonna turn into residential or they're gonna turn into some other function. Um, and that's just how we're gonna continue on to live. 
So uh, I, what I'm hearing is we're going to be doing a lot of retrofitting and not, not whole scale demolition of city blocks and making new buildings. It's just too expensive. Um, I'd like to now turn to the, the next topic that we're going to discuss, which is the buildings in which we live. Obviously, we've, we started working from home, but what kind of what kind of considerations are we going to have when it when it comes to where people are living, making those buildings more healthy, especially multi-dwelling buildings? Uh, Arathi, do you have some thoughts on that one? I think this is again, it's a, always looking for the glasses half full, but I think this is again another opportunity in a market that's been really tough. So, I mean, when we look at the histor historic trends of energy efficiency. Um, residential is the lowest in, in this country and globally, um, even in multifamily housing. And why has the lowest energy efficiency? Well, it follows the cost. It's the lowest cost per square foot. And I think, of course, right now everyone's rethinking. I mean, I personally am rethinking, why did I get that parking space when I don't own a car because I'm a greenie? Why didn't I get the balcony instead? But it was resale value, right? And so those of us in cities are thinking about options like that. Um, but I think people, again, are thinking more about space, gardens, other features that had people historically in the suburbs. Um, but I think it will, again, drive up what the cost per square foot is that people are willing to invest um, and what they're willing to invest in, which I think is very positive because we've gotten to a, uh, this is the biggest investment of most Americans' lives, and it's very, very commodified in a way that's not good for health and it's not good for carbon either. So again, looking at this health and energy carbon nexus, um, I think there's a lot that people are rethinking now. And I don't think that it's gonna mean, um, you know, an exodus to the suburbs. It might be people are looking at different kinds of cities where they can afford a little bit more space. Um, it might be, again, it's not the parking spot anymore, it's something else. Or maybe it is the car because now I can move around. But I think people are thinking about it in a much more nuanced way um, than historically, just bigger, 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 right? Bigger space, which was usually the driver. Yeah, it seems like there's been this sort of initial knee-jerk reaction of we're going to get out of here. We're, we're moving out to the country. Uh, in, in my neighborhood, I live on a mountain in the Blue Ridge west of DC and four brand new houses have gone up in the last you know, four months. So that was highly unusual. Uh, what what do the rest of you think about that? You know, is this just sort of an initial reaction that people are going to leave the cities, or are we are we going to adapt, and how? I'll jump in on that. I think one of the most interesting things about the cities, and this may be even appear off topic, but I don't think it is, is is how much of the cultural institutions people come back to, whether it's sporting events or Broadway or restaurants or bars or whatever you can think of. Um, in a lot of ways that has been something that has drawn lots of people into the city, right? And so if that comes back and it comes back powerfully, I think you're gonna see a lot of people stay. And then back to my original point, if people really wanna spend some time in the office, they're also gonna to need to be, and these offices are in an urban environment, they can't really move so far to the country, which is why I think originally, when we started talking about everybody's gonna to move to the country, that was a knee-jerk reaction to, I can work from home. If I can work from home, I don't need to be near my office. And I think people are rethinking that because they don't want to be so isolated. So I, I think it's a combination of, do you want to spend some time in your office, which I think the answer will be yes for most people. And can we get these cultural institutions that have really, in, in my opinion, made our cities what they are, if we can get them up and running safely, I, I think you're going to see that, that draw to be in a city. Again, to, to, to that 9-11 quote, I, I think 10 years from now, we're still going to want to be in our urban environments for the same reason we want to be there now. Um, so I, I think it will come back around. What it looks like and how fast we get there, I'm not sure. Yeah, to, uh, to Joe, your point about the homes being built, I've already heard a couple of stories in my area of bidding wars for homes, which is you know, unusual in the suburb of New York lately. I mean, we used to have that years ago, but not for quite some time. So we're starting to see that. But, you know, I, I, do, I do agree with you, Peter. I think you're going to start seeing people want to come back. Just how long will that take? I mean, if we go through another pandemic, 
Would you rather quarantine in a 500 square foot apartment uh, without the balcony, or would you rather, you know, quarantine in a 2,500 square foot house with a backyard? It's, and maybe if you have a spouse who works, two offices built into the house as well. Um, it's going to be a, it's going to be a little bit of a balancing act. And I think if, if you can work from all, the office part time, like we we're talking about earlier, you might choose to move a little further away from the city, knowing that you're not doing that long commute every day. If you're doing it a couple of days a week or three days a week, you might be willing to sit on the train for a little longer than to, than to be yeah. that close to work. I think this is a call for cities to work with their regional partners. There's been a long time of a us versus them, right? You, 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 you want to keep the residents or the office workers on your side of the border to retain the taxes. And I think this is really now about a regional approach to, um, to how we're going to be living. So it's not New York City, it's the New York City MSA and living in the Hudson Valley and working, you know, coming into New York City twice a week instead of five times a week is all going to seem like we're all part of the same, um, same community and, and we need to work together more. Kevin, uh, what, what questions do we have on this? We have a great question that ties right into this discussion and it's, and it's about does the panel see more use in high rises of residential and commercial uh, cohabitating becoming part of the same building, you know, leveraging the efficiency of elevators and the heating and uh, air conditioning systems, um, addressing some of the panel's uh, comments. For, for a long time, I always was saying that office was gonna become an amenity of residential and every tall office tower was gonna to have two floors of co-working in some sense. And you, you would subsidize that office amenity because you get some sort of check from your employer to work out of that for a couple of days a week or what have you. And I think that office offering is going to be more and more offered in the residential product, especially the high rise dense residential product. You don't have to get a, a bigger apartment, but you have a floor to go to when you wanna get away from your children. Kate, I, I want to follow up with you on that one. Um, again, I'm, I'm sort of talking from the perspective of the DC area out in the suburbs. We have a lot of mixed use planning going on where, you know, it's required now to have retail in the bottom and uh, uh, apartments, condos up top. And, and the idea is that it will reduce traffic, et cetera. And it's not, you know, we're just seeing people who are, you know, they're still moving to the suburbs, but then they're working in DC and they still have to commute and there's just a lot more tra traffic going crossways every which way. Um, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I think DC, the, I mean, the congestion in DC is that people need to be getting out of their cars more and having more tra public transit options than just what the Metro is providing, right? I think there's an example that people want to go places. We have to figure out how to get them more there more efficiently without the congestion of, of single person vehicle travel. Um, and, and that's going to be a challenge, especially in the near term, at least, because the CDC is saying, yeah. hey, drive, drive a solo now. <laughs> yeah. I think what's going to be interesting is bus. I think the advent of bus rapid transit and where how we're going to be using buses differently is going to be really, really interesting. Yeah, I saw a photo of a bus where they you know, they tape off various seats and the untaped seats you can sit in. So there's this weird, you know, social distancing thing going on. Uh, what do the rest of you all think on, on this question that, that that Kevin proposed? I think for what it's worth from my side, I think you, you touched on one that's absolutely critical. Kate did, and then you mentioned it, which is the public transportation system. And for many, many years, we said, it's gonna work well if there's a great public transportation. As far out as that goes, that's how far people will move, right? So if the train line goes out 50 miles, people will be 50 miles out, 70 miles. And I think it's gonna be really interesting to see how people respond to public transportation. The exact opposite is what's happening in our offices right now. We have 50 of them, so we have all these different kinds. The places where people drive to work are filling up very fast because they don't have to deal with the, the danger or the potential exposure. So it's an odd mix of 
the, the places where we don't have public transportation are working very well to get back in the office. I don't think that's sustainable. I think ultimately we'll figure out a way to safely transit and then, then we'll get back to where we were. But however long that takes, um, and, and it's a tough challenge to, to keep the public transportation, the subways, for instance, safe. Um, that's why I think we're seeing in New York such a very slow movement to come back to the offices. Well, that is the issue. I mean, for, for our firm, I mean, we, we've, I, like all of us, we probably sent out surveys to our staff to figure out what are some of the key drivers. And, and one of the ones that keeps coming up is public transportation. So that's why we're moving very slowly with bringing people back to New York. But our other offices are coming back much more quickly because they are suburban, suburban offices for the most part. They commute via car or bus, or it's a little bit easier. A lot of people are in their own car, um, but Boston, New York, Philadelphia, where they're taking more mass transit, again, it's coming back much more slowly. So we'll have to figure out how to do that safely. And, uh, and mass transit is gonna have to be a part of the equation. And remember that's out of our control as, as, as office leadership, right? As, as firm leadership, yeah. you know, we can, we can yeah. really have pretty good control what's going on in our offices and we can work with our building management to even have pretty good control of what's going on if we're a tenant. Once you get outside of that, and people control their own home environment very well. It's that piece right in the middle that, um, you know, Kate, you mentioned something that struck a nerve is partnering. And you, you mentioned it on a regional level. I think we're gonna mm -hmm. have to really partner with, with the, the mass transit systems and the public transportation systems uh, to, to solve this problem collectively. Yeah, and I think we said it earlier, the subways have never been cleaner. I forget who mentioned it. Yeah. But, uh, you know, that's because there's not much use right now. You know, once we start having more people on the subways, they'll be clean less frequently. There'll be more cars that are out in service at any given time. And it's going to be, again, something we're going to have to help manage because it is a key driver to getting us to where we need to go. Yeah, I mean, there is some collectivism in here as to how we behave as a society that I think Again, it's it's out of our control a little bit, but I mean, not not so much. I think individually we add up, um, and that's why I did say like if we look at our Asian friends in the beginning of this, the first question, I think how they behave in a very organized and very dense places. Um, you know, Hong Kong after SARS, they completely changed their mentality, and they're in a completely different situation now. Um, and again, it wasn't just uh, the engineering community that responded, it was the public health, but it was also just the general public in terms of uh, not having an emergent aversion to masks, you know, using their elbows for buttons if they didn't have gloves, you know, just, I think there are little behavior modifications, as we said, that we'll all get used to. Um, but they do have that, you know, they've had a long mentality in Asia too of, um, you know, live, work, half resi, half office powers. And, um, you know, that wasn't necessarily a commentary uh, like OMA about mixed use and all those things. It was a commentary about speculation in the real estate market. Like, let's make sure the columns facing the engineering can convert um, because we're building these cities so quickly. So I think there is something in that too that's really, um, it's very optimistic and it's about, you know, if we build it, people will come. Uh, and that we should we should kind of borrow from that mentality too. How do we engineer buildings that can be very flexible? You know, Kate, you had that great example too about um, you know resi flexibility with office floors. Um, but again, like how do we how do we design ultimately very flexible spaces that can last a long time? Um, certainly with the RCI. system design. Yeah. But I was, I'm wondering if you have any specific examples you can share with us that you're aware of. Uh, uh, you mentioned, you know, the SARS outbreak and were the, what types of engineering changes were made? Are you, is there anything that you, you know of that you can share with us? Well, there were changes to their, um, their wind code, essentially. So they have one of the most aggressive um, code standards. And people are following it around the world in, in terms of not just wind and the public realm that would blow people over, but also about contaminant control. Um, so these are things that's it's like being a good neighbor um, because one of the contamination points was in the vent stack of two adjacent resi buildings. So the plumbing stack. 
um, there was a reentry point. And so they were wondering, like, it's not just AHUs, but it's also if there's something in that vent stack going wrong that you can contaminate amongst floors. Um, but, you know, again, it's even Peter, you had mentioned that it's, it's not just our disciplines, but there were many other responses from the public health department, how people change their behavior. Um, and certainly we have a very big contribution and particularly in dense environments because there are a lot of um, engineering control points that could facilitate better health management. Uh, Joe, to your point, I think there have been so many unbelievable advancements in fluid mechanics, um, which might be a strange question, but our ability to model how particulates move around um, an environment. And it, it came from the fire industry was doing work and the blast resistant design community was doing work. But this ability to model really high end modeling of how people interact and how fluids interact with people really does exist today in a way that it didn't exist five years ago. So we have the capability. The question is, do we wanna use it and adapt it and really go in that, in that way? Because I, I think we could really solve this problem on a technical level, or at least address it in a way we couldn't previously. Well, actually to that point, we are doing that already. A number of um, higher education institutions have reached out to talk to us about the way they use their classrooms and the placements of students with the air distribution and the airflow across those the students and the people using the room so that they understand that there's a, there's a, an airflow that's not hitting every single student. You're trying to space them out so that the separate airflow is hitting separate groups of students so you're not contaminating everybody in one shot. So you're already starting to look at the computational airflow in a you know, an auditorium or a classroom to see the impacts of having 10 students, 20 students, 100 students, depending on the size of the room. So it, it's something that people are looking at and it's, uh, it's guiding their, the way they're bringing the kids back to school. Kevin, uh, what other questions do we have on this subject? You have a question that um, I think impacts every business out there. It's how does the panel see the balance between densification or efficiency and hygiene? Um, will we be moving? We went from offices to cubes. Are we moving back to offices? How does the panel see that sort of dynamic playing out? Well, for a firm that's never had a private office, I don't see us going to private offices, yeah. but we will probably uh, not be densifying as much anymore. And especially with a little bit of hoteling and a little bit of work from home and part-time work home and, and office, I think it's very easy to uh, de-densify um, and still maintain your office space or even a little bit less office space. I'll take the easy part of that question. I don't think you will see more uh, private offices. Again, you know, a month and a half ago where we had older buildings which had that, we were able to get people back. And then we realized, but why did they go back? Because the whole purpose of being in that office environment to our at this point is to collaborate. And so I think that's the, the one easy one I can give you is in my opinion, that's not the solution to have more people in private offices so that they can social distance and you know, keep their, air, their own environment clean. They may as well work from home at that point. So I don't know that you'll have none of them, but I don't think that's what you'll see. You're gonna see people really trying to figure out how to keep their conference room safe because that's why we go to the office. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's a great point. It's about why are we going to the office? What are we doing at the office? Not do we need just another place to work? And so spaces are gonna be designed around those functions of collaboration and cultivating brand and selling to our clients and making employees happy and wanting to, to work and, and stay at the company. I mean, it's just, uh, you know, working at SOM, we just went through a, a office renovation, which is quite interesting. So all of our major offices in North America are having a new office uh, right as this is hitting. We're like, we have these beautiful spaces that we can't enjoy. We were all excited to go back. I think, you know, Kate hit on this a little bit in some earlier points that, um, you know, we all took as a value almost less desk space and more collaborative and conferencing space. Um, and also recognizing that it is also healthier for us to not just be locked into our desk, only working like this, but we do a lot of 
um, you know, conferencing, more soft spaces, more areas to eat, and then have more informal uh, conversation. So, you know, Peter, your point is to how do you keep those spaces clean beyond like a two, uh, twice a day protocol? It's easy to do that at your desk. You know, you're just, you are wiping that. But I think it, it, it might turn into almost like a gym where you carry your towel everywhere and you wipe down. <laughs> there just becomes a, a different office etiquette in these collaborative spaces. And we've seen that as obviously a design trend. It's uh, nobody wants to see or just always be in that densified area, but everyone wants to be on the soft, soft couch or, you know, in the sling chair um, in the conference room like group thinking. So that's why people are going in and the cappuccino maker, which is far superior to anything we have at home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that sort of goes to another question of those, those other shared spaces that we haven't really talked about the, the kitchen, the bathroom. I was reading an article about how uh, you can, with the sort of power flushes. Now you aerosol, uh, you know, not to get too into it, but there's a health issue in the restrooms now. Uh, how, how, do, how do you all see addressing those communal space health issues? Yeah, Erethi. We've started talking about that uh, vacuum flushing, which has long been the con of the noise and it's annoying, but the aerosol is much less. Um, we were talking about that on a recent airport. So it significantly reduces the amount of water reduces the aerosol, but for a long time, everyone was like, eh, sounds terrible, which it does, you know, but if you're in an airport and you're already used to hearing that on the plane, um, but I think these are conversations. I think there's also, and again, an interesting social nexus with these conversations about gender fluidity and how do we plan? Because um, again, we often do our plumbing just based on code counts. And we don't think about having more counts, you know, both for, um, you know, for people to feel safe with gender fluidity for mother's rooms and other things. So I think it's going to change the way we engineer and plan for these spaces to try to be not just code, but above that, you know, think about people first. Um, and how do you have, you know, an extra sink or two. And so people could be spaced out like you go in the bathroom, you don't have to be right next to someone because you just had the code minimum. You could go every other. So these are some of the things we're thinking about, and it's interesting because even standards like um, the well certification are, they've been asking about things like this, and now this is kind of coming up a little bit more. Like, how do you, how do you have more counts of these essential places to clean? Yeah, I mean, you touched on it. Code, code was always the code minimum, and, you know, when you're designing a building, you're looking at what, is, what do I need to do to meet code? I think we're we're going we're getting to a place where we're going far beyond what code requires and and what is appropriate now. Yeah, Kevin. Uh, some more questions. So we have a a, a question that specifically uh, I think it's from a designer, and the question is, can the panel discuss educational facilities and the challenge of social distancing among children with large classroom settings? What what is the solution to that? Well, you can social distance in the classroom. I don't know if you can social distance in the quad and in the bar and every place else the kids go. But uh, as far as what a lot of the higher ed is looking at right now is, is limiting the class sizes. So if you had typically you use a small classroom for a class size, you're using your medium sized classroom for that, that class size. And the medium went into a large and a large became a virtual class. So you're, you're using larger rooms for the, than the number of students that you had. Um, my daughter's actually just entering college now, and they just actually today emailed their list of what they're doing. And it's uh, masks are going to be required everywhere in common spaces when you can't social distance. Um, and they're looking at flushing out their HVAC systems much more often. So when you're running a school building, you're, um, you're using, instead of ending the day at, at four o'clock or five o'clock and shutting the systems down, you're running it for an extra hour with extra ventilation air to flush this, the building out. So there's gonna be a number of techniques that they're going to be doing to, in order to make sure that they can keep the spaces clean. It's just, it, it will be a challenge. Kids, kids don't always follow the rules as, as much as they probably should. I think one of the challenges will be the short-term issue and then the long-term issue. 
Um, and I, I think Dino just did a great job of talking about using very reasonable methods in the short term. The other one that we're seeing is, and as I mentioned with the offices, colleges are splitting classes. So if you have two classes a week, one time you're in the, in the class and one time you're the remote person. So I think the next two semesters, we'll see a lot of that. And the real question will be, let's say we get our hands around this virus, right? Let's say we get a vaccine. Do people go back to the way we did things previously and start packing people into classrooms? Or do we say this is the first of many of these potential pandemics that we may have? And are they all airborne? And are the same solutions there? So, you know, my, one of my partners loves to talk about the fact that we're in the fog right now. And we know some of our challenges, but the really big challenge for the designers is, you know, you're designing a building right now. And, and do you design it as if this isn't going to be here and we're going to solve it? And in the near term, you use social distancing and hand washing and masks. Or do you say these kind of pandemics may be coming again and let's build something into this facility? And that's a really big challenge for the designers right now. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would just add to this and I think people can tell already in the audience that I'm the engineers for uh, a better social, <laughs> social fabric. So I keep making these points, but um, you know, this even gets back to classroom size or what we advocate for. Cause we, we get pushed, I think as engineers all the time to be code minimum. It's a lot of invisible things and there might be things that are very visible, like features that people want to pay for. And so there is a space in this too. There's a, a broader conversation about um, pedagogy and classroom size. But this moment is saying, you know, actually protect children, protect that institution of learning and have less children in the classroom that um, even though we're in the fog, maybe we can, we can be advocates for that after we get out of the fog. <laughs> Kevin, uh, one yeah. last question, and then I'm gonna ask everyone for some uh, closing thoughts on this. Okay, this, this question ties into the code discussion and uh, the American Disabilities Act drove a lot of projects for all of us over the years. Does the panel see the government and different government agencies creating many more code modifications with this pandemic uh, in all different um, facets of, of projects, so, you know, such as simple things like uh, increasing the uh, distance between uh, bathroom facilities and, and the inside the bathrooms, et cetera? I'll take a quick shot at that. I hope we don't do that. Uh, and Dino alluded to it in sort of Arathy, and I think Kate did also. At my preference would be we go more towards a performance-based design. Um, we've done it for seismic. Uh, we have a lot of structural engineers. So we like when the code specifies what kind of performance the building would need to have. And I think if we do see code changes, I'd love them to be performance-based changes. And then you would let the engineering and the architectural societies uh, really figure out the best way to solve that rather than mandating specific things. Uh, I, I personally would like to see that flexibility. Yeah, I would agree. And it's, it's you know, going back to, that was a perfect way to describe it, Peter, the fog. But we saw a similar thing with 9-11 and, mm -hmm. and fire codes. And um, I, I think, again, because we, we are seeing that the science is changing on what works best or not and I also think what works best for this particular disease might not be the same as what works for flu or, or other things that we're still gonna be concerned about. Um, a performance-based method would be really important versus being very reactionary to just this specific um, instance of health concern. So I'm gonna ask the, the final question for each of you. And uh, Kate, I'm gonna let you start us out on this one, give you a second to uh, get your thoughts uh, prepared here. but. So we thought we talked about a lot of things today. The we talked about the buildings we work in, we live in, the public transit, educational settings. What are what are buildings going to look like ten years from now that that we haven't included today? What are the you know? I want you to put your crystal ball out there and tell us you know what's going to be standard in ten years that that isn't today. I think you're going to see buildings uh -huh. that are going to be much more flexible. Um, you're going to, I'm sorry, was that directed towards me? <laughs> no, go on, go on. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I think it's going to have to be much more flexible. I, we've spent a lot of time, I, I think I started by saying, looking at energy efficiency and not so much the wellness of the people using the building. We're going to have to focus on the wellness part of the building 
and make sure that the occupants are, are safe and are taken care of and it become a, a respite for them, not so much a, a place they're dreading to go to, but a place they want to go to. Kate. I think, um, well, I mean, it's hard to have a crystal ball. I think um, we're going to, you know, adapt to new technologies on how we do it that are going to become commonplace. I mean, I, I think we we change so quickly from home, from working in the office to working at home, that I think we can change our behavior to do anything. So if we put our minds together and try to make our society better for whether, whether it's climate or equity, I think we can force ourselves to have better behaviors in that sense. And so maybe it's more not about what how the buildings will look differently, but maybe we'll have different people in the buildings and we'll be using them in a different way for betterment of our society. I hope. Peter, what do you think? You know, I, I always have two words. Dino stole the first, which was flexibility. The second one I'll throw in is, is comfort. Um, people are going to expect more from their buildings because they're comfortable in their home and they know they could be there. So the two things about coming to the office are first, what is your reason for being there? And I have a reason. Now I expect to have a view or, you know, I can open my window and get fresh air. So I think that was already coming, but I think the pressure on the design community is going to be huge to be comfortable in the office. Erithi, I'm going to give you the last word here today. What's yeah, going to be no different pressure. 10 years from now? <laughs> no pressure with all of these uh, superstars, but I do think, to Kate's point, you know, the future, there's going to be a mul multiplicity. We don't know. But, I mean, we do know that we have an aging population, so health is going to continue to be top of mind. Um, and, and, Joe, you said it well, that it's going to be just not something that we're going to forget tomorrow. It's going to be a generation of us being very mindful. Um, but we also have the climate eight ball. So I, I think that there is, in 10 years, I hope that both of these things have more of a symbiotic relationship as compared to what they've been in the past, where we've been exclusively efficiency and exclusively health. And that's been, I think, really damaging to the engineering of our buildings. that it's like, it was never both win-win, it was always one or. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty hopeful that we're looking at these solutions that are really quite clever and bring the cost down, they become more ubiquitous and uh, they look at that nexus of efficiency and health. Um, and I think there's a lot of things that are really quite exciting now, too. It's like already, you know, everyone's talking about this filtration, humidity, like very aggressively. And we've been circling the drain on that for a long time. And I think we're getting very serious right now. You know, Peter, even to your point about comfort, it's like, well, you know, we, we hedge because of code, because of liability. But now we're getting serious in our forums about, okay, come on, like, what's, what's going to be the best thing? And um, I think that's the part where it's, it's really fun and geeky and it's fun to hang out with engineers on those topics. So I'm very hopeful that <laughs> Great. people will come well, to, you know, what are the good conclusions? Yeah. All right. Well, thank you to all our panelists. Daphne's going to have a, the final uh, goodbye here for us, but Arathy, Peter, Kate, Dino, and, and Kevin, thanks for fielding those questions for us as well. Uh, Daphne, back to you. Thanks, Joe, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you to our panelists and our donors for making this session possible. Lots of great information and uh, giving us something to think about. We have a short evaluation that we will send you this afternoon, so uh, please share your experience with us. And be sure to join us on July 16th for our next session, Funding in the New Normal. Have a great afternoon and stay well. <laughs>